Theophilus Most Excellent here, and today I'm coming at you with a pretty controversial topic, that is whether or not your Christmas tree is satanic. Some people would ask more simply whether or not it's just pagan, but I'm actually going to go a step further than that and I'm going to address whether or not it's actually satanic. So I'm raising the bar. Right off the bat though, just let me say that I'm not making this video to condemn or alienate my Christian brothers and sisters out there who celebrate some form of Christmas. Personally, I don't celebrate it for various reasons, but I can understand why many Christians do. I mean, many were brought up celebrating it as children and it becomes kind of nostalgic for them, or they observe it because they actually believe that the Lord was born on that specific day, 2,000 years ago, or roundabout. And we can debate that issue, but if you're a Christian and it's your conviction that Jesus was actually born on this day, I would understand why you would want to reverence this day. However, I would caution people out there with scripture. Uh, the Lord tells us in Jeremiah chapter 10 that we're not to learn the ways of the nations, meaning the world has many traditions, but we're to be a people that are set apart from the world as God's own possession. We're not to be like the world in all of its different ways. And so my appeal to you would be to just avoid the worldly aberrations of Christmas. You know, like the many secular traditions that have become part and parcel of the modern Christmas holiday. So like spending hundreds or even thousands of dollars on Christmas lights, all kinds of decorations and presents, basically materialism, and materialism in that kind of form is spoken against in scripture. I mean, if you got an extra thousand dollars lying around that you can just spend on some light bulbs, man, give that to somebody who needs it. Give it to charity or missionary fund of some kind. And I know some will say that, you know, the giving of gifts goes back to Jesus receiving gifts on the first Christmas when the wise men came to him. But I would just simply point out that Jesus was presented with gifts because he was God incarnate. It was a form of worship by the Magi who gave them to him, technically. I mean, they were giving him gifts as if he were a king, and they had just finished worshiping him. I mean, should we also worship one another just because that's what happened to the Lord on the first Christmas here in the same exact verse? I mean, don't get me wrong, it's better to give than to receive, but the Lord wasn't speaking about giving out Xbox Ones and hoverboards, he was talking about caring for those who are actually in need. And so I would just call all those Christians out there partaking of the more worldly form of this holiday to rethink what you're doing. Because ultimately, we're all accountable to the Lord, and we all stand or fall based on what He thinks of our choices. And so I hope you'll live in such a way as to please Him, and not me, or your family members, or even yourself. So really, I'm not trying to attack anything that may or may not be biblical about Christmas, like whether Jesus was born on December 25th or not. I don't believe that he was. Uh, I don't see anything in scripture about it. You know, we have some traditions that are passed down, but if you're just celebrating Christmas solely based around the fact that Jesus was born on that day and you're not partaking in these other worldly things, then we can just agree to disagree about that kind of stuff. And so my objective in this video is just to discuss the man-made tradition of the Christmas tree. Because I don't think it's even possible to argue from the Bible that the Christmas tree is a legitimate tradition. In fact, it would seem to be the exact opposite because, like I said, I want to demonstrate from the Bible that it's actually a symbol meant to glorify Satan and not Jesus and not God or anything like that. And so, as I alluded to before, it's actually pretty easily proven that the Christmas tree has pagan origins, as you can see from Wikipedia and their source, the Encyclopedia Britannica. But again, I want to go a step further than that. I don't just want to show it's pagan. I actually want to try to demonstrate from the scriptures that this thing is satanic. But just keep in mind that, you know, I'm not bringing anything to bear here that's irrefutable fact or undeniable evidence. I mean, there's always room for varying interpretation. But that being said, I think it's pretty self-evident. So, right away, I bet a ton of people who clicked on this video thought they knew exactly where I'd go in the Bible to argue that the Christmas tree is pagan or satanic. Jeremiah 10, right? A tree from the forest is cut down, you know, they decorate it with silver and gold. Sounds a bit like a Christmas tree, eh? What's worse is I already quoted from that chapter, even. But here's the thing, it's not a Christmas tree. I mean, it's talking about idols being made, and they're being overlaid with metal, and, you know, hammer nails is holding them in place so that they won't fall over and things like that, but definitely not a Christmas tree. Unfortunately, a lot of well-meaning Christians will go to that passage to try to show that uh, Christmas is pagan and the Bible condemns it and whatnot, but 
Nah, I mean, it tells you right there in that passage that it's talking about idols. So, scratch that. What I actually want to show you, though, is one you've probably never heard before. And so to begin here, uh, just let me ask you a question. What do trees represent in the Bible? Because if the Christmas tree represents something, what better source to go to to try and figure out what it represents? I mean, if we're putting these trees up in our houses, what does that mean? Especially to God, what would it represent in his eyes? Well, let's take a look at a few verses here and try and figure out what exactly the Bible tries to represent when it uses the symbol of a tree. Well, the first one here, Daniel chapter 4, it's all about Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel has to come along and interpret it for him. And the interpretation that he gives is actually that the tree represents Nebuchadnezzar himself and his mighty kingdom, that is Babylon, and it's being taken away from him. And that's symbolized by the tree being cut down. And then I hop and a skip over to Ezekiel chapter 31, and we see the kingdom of Assyria is actually symbolized in much the same way, as a great tree whose top touches the heavens. And then we have in Isaiah chapter 2, in like manner, we see the prideful kingdoms of man symbolized as various tall trees, and God is saying he's going to bring them down. Then you got Jeremiah chapter 11, where Israel is symbolized as an olive tree. And then you have in Psalm 92 what seems to be the gathering of all the saints in the heavenly temple, and they're being portrayed as trees here. And really, Old Testament verses like these ones could be multiplied exponentially. I mean, it just, there's so many of them. But I'll just leave it at those ones. Those ones are pretty right in your face, hard to miss, but I also want to show you some from the New Testament. And so, in Matthew 13, you got Jesus, and he's telling the parable of the mustard seed, where it grows to become this large tree. And this, he says, represents the kingdom of heaven. And then you have Luke 13, and again, Jesus telling a parable, and it's the parable of the barren fig tree. And a lot of people would interpret this parable as representing Israel and how it's not producing the fruits that God wants when he comes to get the fruits. They're not there. And the Son of God would be the servant in the parable who's petitioning the Lord, asking for more time. And this would represent, like, Jesus. He's there with the Jews in Israel, and he's trying to buy them more time, but they won't listen to him him and they're not going to produce their fruit and so they get chopped down in 70 AD by the Romans. But then we have Paul in Romans chapter 11 where he symbolizes the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians as being two different types of trees. And lastly, in Revelation 9, John seems to connect the trees of the earth to Christians who have the seal of God. And that kind of makes sense of this verse in chapter 7 also, when you look at it this way, as the trees being the servants who are going to receive the seal of God. And that's why he tells the angels not to harm the trees, because he's actually concerned for the servants of God, not just actual trees. But as I was saying before, this is really just a tiny sampling. There's a lot of different symbolism throughout scripture like this. But the cool part is, is that the interpretation of these symbols is consistent throughout scripture. So when trees are used as a symbol in the Bible, it's to represent people or a kingdom, which is really just a large gathering of people. So yeah. Okay, so now that we've looked at these Bible verses, let's put our thinking caps on and ask ourselves the question, if we were going to use the Bible as a lens to interpret what the Christmas tree symbolizes, what would we see? Well, obviously, it would be a kingdom or a group of people, because that's what the tree represents when it's used as a symbol in Scripture. Okay, so that's not so bad, right? How is that satanic? Well, I would suggest that there's something else that we should also try to interpret through the lens of scripture, and that is the Christmas tree topper, the star that's usually put on top of the tree. When scripture uses the symbol of a star, what does it represent? Well, that's a pretty simple one also. In Revelation, the interpretation is pretty clear. Stars represent angels, and you can see that. In chapter 1 of Revelation, Jesus himself tells us the interpretation of what the stars represent. And then you also have this star who's fallen in chapter 9, and it's obviously personified as being a person of some kind, and it's very likely an angel considering what Jesus told us in chapter 1. But also in scripture, you have Job chapter 38, where it connects the image of stars with the sons of God, which refers to the angelic beings in God's presence. And then back to Daniel chapter 8, it speaks of the Antichrist becoming so great that he throws down some of the stars, which are also referred to here as the host. And this is the same Hebrew word that is often used to speak of the Lord of hosts. And so it's a reference to God's innumerable angelic armies. 
And so again, the interpretation is pretty clear. Stars represent angels in scripture. And so again, ask yourself, if we look at the Christmas tree through the lens of scripture, what would it symbolize? And the answer, if you're tracking along here, would be that the tree itself would represent a kingdom of sorts, and then the star at the peak would represent an angel who is presumably sitting at the highest point of the kingdom, like the king of the kingdom or something like that. Well, we know that Satan is a fallen angel, and so you're starting to see the connections here. I mean, obviously, it's kind of a stretch still, but just hang in there. It gets a little more obvious as you go on here. But let's see here. What else do people put up there on top of their Christmas tree as a Christmas tree topper? That would be an angel. That's actually the older tradition, is that people would put an angel on top of their tree. And you may be thinking, all right, so it's an angel. How do we know it's not some other angel? How do we know it's not Michael or whoever? Well, the reason I come to that conclusion is because the angel that's put up there is almost always portrayed in one of two ways. The most common way, and this is the way that my family's Christmas tree was, uh, is that the angel up there is going to have a candle in its hands, or it's going to be holding two candles, and usually they're little Christmas lights and they light up for you. And the second most common way that you're going to see this angel portrayed is with a musical instrument of some kind, uh, like a harp or some type of guitar. But here's the thing, both of these characteristics can be directly connected to the biblical Satan. So in Ezekiel 28, and it's a passage that's widely ascribed to Satan because of the qualities of this so-called cherub who was in Eden. You know, it says something about the king of Tyre, but this guy's been in Eden, he's a cherub, he's profaned his sanctuaries. I don't think the king of Tyre is an anointed cherub, just saying. And so a lot of people would see this as Satan but it speaks of how he had musical instruments infused into his body from the day he was created. And the statement has caused many to speculate that Satan was some kind of song leader in heaven before his fall. I mean, I don't know about all that, but you can definitely see Satan's connection to musical instruments here. But what's even worse is that the candle in the hands of this angel is a really obvious allusion to it being Lucifer. And that's the name that's applied to Satan in the book of Isaiah. And you can actually see my video, Is Lucifer Satan? for biblical proof that the two persons are actually one and the same. But here's the thing, the Latin term Lucifer literally means light bearer. And that's exactly what you have portrayed in these Christmas tree toppers. It's a light bearing angel. I don't think you can get any more blatant than that. But it gets even crazier because Isaiah 14, where the term Lucifer actually comes from, seems to be what the Christmas tree is actually portraying. Because besides another connection of Satan to the musical instruments again here in this chapter, Lucifer pridefully declares that he will exalt his throne above the heights of the clouds, just like those trees we read about in Daniel and Ezekiel. And he even claims that he's going to set his throne on high above all the stars of God. And remember, that's the angels. But God here essentially says, says, uh, nope, Satan, I actually have other plans for you. And he claims that Satan's going to be cut down to the ground and he'll become like a fallen tree. And that's why he says, how art thou fallen, O Lucifer? But the Hebrew word here for cut down is nigdata, and it derives from gada. Hopefully I pronounced those right. I'm not really very fluent in Hebrew, but the word essentially means chopping wood or you're hewing down trees, you're cutting down trees. So it's literally like God is promising to chop Satan's kingdom down like a tree. And that's the reason he's said to be the fallen one. It's because God comes out like a woodcutter and he cuts him down because he doesn't like how this tree's growing. And not only that, but verse 8 also contains the same kind of tree symbolism saying that since Satan's kingdom has been chopped down, none of the other trees have had to worry about the woodcutter coming and chopping them down. And that almost certainly represents the many kingdoms that Satan deceived before his fall. So hopefully you can see here how closely this picture in Isaiah 14 aligns with this symbolism present in the Christmas tree. It all seems to match up a little too well. And I realize this could all just be coincidence, but we have to remember also, this could be the designs of Satan himself. I mean, he knows the scriptures really well. Remember, that's how he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. He tried to use scriptures against him to get him to do what he wanted him to do. And so don't put it past the devil to use scripture to bring glory to himself because he's done it before. 
But just a tiny bit of evidence that I'd call your attention to outside of the scriptures would be the proposed origins of the Christmas tree and how it was used in medieval plays to represent what's called the tree of paradise. And paradise there would refer to Eden, the Garden of Eden. And you can see in this quote on the screen that in these plays they would hang apples from it to represent the forbidden fruit, which in modern times has been replaced by glass bulbs. That's where we get the tradition of the glass bulbs. But I mean, think about this. If this is supposed to be a tree from the Garden of Eden, and they're hanging these apples up there to represent the forbidden fruit, that would make this the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, meaning the original Christmas tree represented the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that Satan himself appeared in to tempt Adam and Eve. And now in modern times, it's topped with a light-bearing angel. I mean, can you see what's going on here? I'd say the answer to that original question of whether the Christmas tree is satanic or not is an emphatic yes. I mean, you gotta be on your guard, Christian. You can't just let any old thing pass through undetected. Because there's a roaring lion out there, and he's seeking someone like you to devour. So don't just wander through this life naively assuming the world is a generally good place with no sharp edges for you to run into. Scripture tells us this world and its traditions are against God, and we're to flee all appearance of evil. Don't think that just simply saying you celebrate all these unbiblical parts of Christmas for God makes it right or okay. The Israelites did the same thing, and 3,000 of them were killed in a single day. They too partook of worldly practices in the name of the Lord. When they made the golden calf, they threw a big old party in honor of the Lord himself, that is Jehovah, Yahweh. They thought that they were doing it in his honor, but actually he had them killed for doing it. And that just goes to show that doing something in God's name name does not necessarily equate to him being pleased about it. I mean, he's not going to be happy if you go out and sin in his name. There are many things that you shouldn't do in the name of the Lord. And so I'd encourage you to sincerely try to discern what is pleasing to him and do that. And if it's celebrating all these worldly elements that you find in the Christmas tradition, then that's fine. Serve him with all your heart, but one day we will give an account to him. And so you want to make sure that you're actually trying to discern sincerely discern what his will for you is. checking out the video and hope it was edifying in at least some way to you. And really one of the main reasons I put out this video wasn't to get in a whole big debate over Christmas and whatnot. It was more just to tell my followers, my subscribers who've been waiting patiently for something new to come out, to just tell them I'm still alive, I'm still working on stuff. Because it's been several months since I put something out and I've actually gotten a few messages asking if I'm still alive, where am I, and whether I'm going to make something new. And actually the whole reason why it's been such a long wait is because I have been working on a video and it's just really technical. I go into a lot of detail in it, and it's taken me months and months of study and prayer to get this far with it. And so I'm getting closer to finishing it, and I hope it's going to be a huge blessing to the saints when it's finally done, because it's a lot of work I've been putting into it. So please pray for that, that it comes along speedily, and that God uses it to bless as many people as possible. And the thing is, is if you've been a subscriber for very long, you'll know that it usually takes me a pretty long time to put out new content. And that's because I prefer quality to quantity to just mass amounts of videos. I'd rather release the best content I can make and have less subscribers because I don't make enough stuff than put out shallow stuff and get like 500,000 subs. I mean, I basically want my subscribers to know that when they see that I've dropped a new video, they can look forward to it being good, something they haven't heard, something new, fresh, something edifying, something actually worth their time, not just clickbait or something they've heard a million times from other channels. And so, yeah, I'm still around still making videos it's just a slow process but if you're patient it's gonna pay off in the end I got a lot of videos planned it's just I want to make them as good as I possibly can and another thing that I should mention is that I've decided to make a patreon account per the request of one of my subscribers so I don't know if you'd like to see more of my time devoted to making videos instead of other things you can help that happen by donating I guess 
But either way, even if you don't want to donate, I just want to thank all you guys for being patient with me and for subscribing to my channel and for all the support and prayers. It's truly appreciated. And with that, I love all you guys very much. And as always, Godspeed.